I just thought we were live, but there you are. It's all right. So these are just some pointers for discussion, as you can see in the board. Um, we'll come back to that. I'll give you time to think about it. If you've not got a question for yourself, um, these are just pointers. What was the original purpose of the law? What was the original purpose of the law? And by that, I actually mean the Ten Commandments. What was its shortcomings? And do you think God was aware of that? Um, that last one, do you think God was aware of it? I don't want a yes or a no answer. Uh, if you say yes, I want to know why you're saying yes. And if you say no, it would be good to hear why you're saying no as well. And again, that's for the folks online. So when you're thinking about them, um, part of this week which I thought would be important is what is the practical implications of grace and the law for us? What are the practical implications for the grace and the law? When I was thinking about this, and boy did I think about this, um, you might not believe me, but this morning at half past four in the morning, I finished this. I hadn't started it at 12 o'clock last night or 11 o'clock last night, but I finished. I started it at half past four this morning. I just couldn't get anything at all, um, which is really frustrating, um, but eventually managed to get some. And when I was thinking about this, my mind went to James chapter 2. And, of course, James chapter 2 is the great um, chapter, if you like, about faith and works. The comparison that James draws between um, faith and works. And when I was thinking about that, I thought, you know, grace and law is a wee bit like that. There is a comparison there that we can draw from it. It says in James 2, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith? but does not have works, cannot save, that cannot faith save him. And we could almost translate that into the idea or the concept about the law and grace. If somebody keeps the law, can the law save him? If somebody keeps the law, can the law save them? It goes on, if a brother or a sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them things they need for the body, what good's that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And in fact, actual fact, even if we take that concept, grace alone um, will not save us in one sense. If we disobey all the laws that God has laid before us, then we have got to question our faith. We have got to question whether we have received, um, whether we have received grace or not. And so it goes on. Um, and then we can go to he passages like Hebrews and Hebrews ten. I'm not going to take. Te take time to read it all because I want to leave time for questions and answers as well it says for <clears throat> since the law has but a shadow of good things to come instead of a true form of these realities it can never be by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near otherwise would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of the sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And that is a very, very important verse and chapter in Scriptures, because the blood of bulls, like the Old Testament, the sacrificial laws, that will never, ever take away our sins. There is only one way 
that we can um, receive forgiveness, and that is through Christ. And of course, he is the ultimate sacrifice, so he is. Um, <clears throat> there's another bit I was going to touch on. As I said about the pharisaical laws, these were laws made by religious leaders of the temple. And keeping them, for all how honourable that might have been, to try and keep these laws of the temple, these laws of the Pharisees made, that would never ever save us. It would never save us. These laws expose our sin, but these laws don't save us from our sins. They might expose our sin, but they never save us from our sins. I couldn't believe it actually, and this certainly wasn't planned. Um, speak about the Holy Spirit intervening. Um, when I was looking at that this morning, suddenly realised that Martin Luther, who posted the 95 Thesis on the door of the church, you remember the Reformation, and um, Martin Luther was very much part of the Catholic Church at that time. He saw the errors in that, so he did. So he po posted the 95 Thesis um, on the church door. And interestingly enough, that was done on Hallow's Eve. Interesting enough, what's today's date? So it was quite, I don't believe it's coincidental, but it's a bit crazy that I was looking at that this morning and Martin Luther, he posted that on Hallow's Eve. The world of the late medieval Roman Catholic Church from which the 16th century reformers emerged, emerged was a complex one. Over the centuries, the Church, particularly in the office of the papacy, had become deeply involved in political life of Western Europe. The, result, the resulting intrigues and political manipulations combined with the Church's increase in power and wealth contributed to the bankrupting of the Church as a spiritual force. Again, we need to realise that if the church changes its focus and changes its focus from Christ, from the Holy Spirit, from God to the laws, then we are at risk of spiritual bankruptcy. And I do firmly believe that. As soon as we change our focus, and actually... I think that's either personally or as a group. As soon as we change our focus from spiritual things to um, these man-made rules, as, as it were, then we're at risk of spiritual bankruptcy. Luther saw this, and hence the Reformation begun. I think... To put it simply, Luther was probably fed up trying to keep all with the laws. Um, so he was. He was certainly had sore knees trying to do that as well. So he did. So we need to always remember that in a practical sense for us. I mean, it's actually like, you might get a lot of references to cars or driving or whatever it is. Um, but that's okay because that's where my mind goes. If you like, um, if you're going down a 1 in 10 degree hill, 10% degree hill, whatever it is, and you don't heed that warning, and you don't shift into a lower gear, especially if you've got a truck, if you don't shift into a lower gear, you're at risk of damaging yourself or damaging someone else. In other words, you're on a slippy slope, so yeah. 
Um, and really, realistically, that can be the same if we change our focus from the spiritual things to the things of these man-made laws. We're at risk of going down a slippery slope. And we always need to keep that in mind. We'll come on to that other stuff maybe later. We'll see how it goes. So, what do we think? First one. What was the original purpose of the law? What was the original purpose of the law? Don't be shy. Or maybe you've got a question or a comment. Right? Yeah? Yeah? I mean, in, in a, a basic format, the reason for the law, the purpose, one of the reasons or one of the purpose, purposes for the law was there was to, because of disobedience. And God actually brought that in so that he could direct them to himself. Any other thoughts or comments or questions? Doesn't need to be about things on there, by the way, it can be about anything. I think we have actually covered all these, so this, the answer should have been given. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we've got the, one of the purposes, or one of the original purposes of the law was the fact that there was disobedience. And also, God was wanting to implement something to try and bring people back to him. And of course, when we're speaking about the laws, we are primarily speaking about the Ten Commandments. So we are. What was the shortcoming? What was its shortcoming? What was the shortcomings of the law? I hinted at that today as well. Human yeah, yeah, you're right. You're so right. That's one of the things. Um, in what sense, when we say human beings, in what sense is that a shortcoming? Right, right, yeah. We will... Yeah, yeah. Um, I, think we said, I think we said last year, last year? I think we said last week, um, as soon as you put the word don't in front of a sentence, you're asking for trouble because whoever it is you're saying it to nine times out of ten will turn around and go and do it. Um, I mean, that's human nature, isn't it? But there is another, um, that's one, thanks for that. But there's another shortcoming as well. Another shortcoming of the laws. Spot on, yeah, yeah. Um, aye, you, can, <laughs> you couldn't uh, say it better, really. Um, what can it, I'm sorry, um, I'm not trying to use names and this is absolutely brutal, but what kind of, if you can think of what kind of other things might go by the wayside, because that's a really good point. Really good point. If our sole purpose what we're saying, if our sole purpose is just to keep the law, what kind of other things might go by the wayside? Th 
Thank you for the charitable work. Thank you for the community work because our, our um, thoughts and everything is just so that we'll come to church or that day, right? I need to keep this law and that law. Uh, I need to make sure I didn't have that kind of thought. I need to make sure I need, we're tied up with that. So we are just so caught up with that. And I think maybe in one sense, um, we might look at this next week because our subject that we're going to look at next week um, is Christ came, Christ came to fulfill the law. So he did. He came to fulfill the law. And we might look at this um, next week. But I think that was possibly um, one of Martin Luther's issues. Um, so it was, was the fact that they were just focusing in worship. They were probably just focusing on that. And they never gave um, room because as soon as we focus on the law um, like that, um, then we didn't give room for the Holy Spirit, etc., to, to work. Neither we can. Any other thoughts about the shortcoming of the law? I don't think we covered this. Weren't the one that I'm thinking about, actually. I think a lot of the time, the law puts parameters on what you can do and what you shouldn't have parameters. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I need to watch because I'm live on Facebook, but yep, you're right. It, it, so if we become, I mean, another name for it, um, unfortunately, another way, another name for a group um, that would strictly go by the law is being legalistic. Um, and if we're too legalistic, then that is very, very dangerous. Um, and if we kind of go almost Old Testament way, as it were, um, then that's not leaving room for stuff that you're speaking about. There it is. Um, sadly, I better watch because I get on my hobby horse here, but sadly, when I was growing up in that kind of era, um, the kind of church was all about thou shalt not. If you understand what I mean? In other words, the things you shouldn't do. Didn't they concentrate on the, so much on the things you're allowed to do, but concentrating on the things that you weren't allowed to do. Um, and we have got freedom, there is no question, we've got freedom for the law, and we'll come on to that maybe if we've got time. Um, so we will, we'll see how it goes, because that's another practical application. Any other shortcomings that we might think about? In our reading in Hebrews, um, it says this, And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. So there is another shortcoming of the law. It will never, ever take away away sins. It may expose sins, but it will never take away sins. There's only one thing, and of course that's the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sins. Um, so it is. Last question, do you think God was aware of this? Do you think God was aware of this? 
I'm going to go eh. No, no, didn't heat. No, didn't heat. So if he was aware of this, um, why? Or what did he do? Right, that's a, here, another subject for another day. He knows every, everything, so he has got to know about it. So he has. Um, he has the Almighty, isn't he, after all? Yeah. Okay. We'll go on to our next set of questions. Knowing that the law would ultimately fail, why do you think God still gave Moses the law? Knowing that the law would ultimately fail, why do you think God still gave Moses the law? Why Yeah. Yeah. Just as we've been saying. Yeah. Well, this is, if we didn't know that there was a right and a wrong, just as the way if there's no law, then we don't know what grace truly is. Huh. So you don't know what dark is unless there's light. So you don't know what true grace is until you misbehave and are forgiven. Yep, 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 spot on now. Eh? I must really know what grace is then. Because <laughs> I've misbehaved quite a bit. <laughs> no, but you're right. You're, you're so right as well. All right. Any other thoughts on that? Um, I'm trying not to get ahead of myself here because we'll be looking at some of this next week. Um, As I said, the law um, is there for more than one purpose. I mean, it highlights grace, it makes us realize uh, the rights are wrong, and what else was said there as, as well. So it was. Um, but actually, I mean, can you imagine? If we just had grace, um, if we just had forgiveness, um, if we just had justification, sanctification, etc. Can you imagine if we just had that? What chaos would be if there was no laws? It would be absolutely mental. So it would be. Can you imagine the turmoil that there might be there? Um, the damage that might be done. Look at the damage that's done actually when there is laws. <laughs> Never mind when there's no laws. I always go back to the film um, Bruce Almighty. And um, Bruce becomes God for a day. He's allowed to be God for, for a day. And he keeps getting all these prayer requests coming from every direction and he's saying, how on earth am I going to handle all these prayer requests? There's too many coming in. Um, and he goes, oh, I know what he'll do. I know what he'll do. It was all set up with a computer and they kept coming into the computer. He says, I'll just press yes to every single prayer request. And then of course the, the camera goes back to the, to the world or a city and there's total chaos. So there is total chaos. Same with the law. If the law wasn't there, we wouldn't have any guidance, um, as we've been saying. <clears throat> I chucked this one in, actually, um, to get some thoughts. So, if I knew that the law was going to fail, then let's just have a shortcut. And let's just send... Jesus first. Why do we need all the other stuff? Why can't we just say, right, okay, let's just have a wee shortcut here and let's just send, send Jesus. The right. Timing wasn't it right, yeah. yeah. Again, going back to what we were saying earlier, yeah. Any other thoughts? 
Again, if you don't experience the strictness of the law, you don't know what grace is. Don't know. So, if you didn't have to go through the whole process of sacrifice and everything like that before, then you don't understand what it is when somebody sacrifices something for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, you wouldn't know what true forgiveness, etc., really is. Any other thoughts on that? <laughs> well, I, yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, I do, I, I think it's, it's a whole thing. Um, it is a whole thing about the law has been there to uh, um, expose the sin as well. I mean, if there weren't there, there wouldn't be any need for Jesus either, I don't suppose, in that sense. But no, you're right. Okay. On to the next thing. This is the final one. Despite knowing that we cannot find life through the law, in what ways are we tempted to make our faith about the law rather than about grace? Before we ask that, maybe just clarify that first part. Despite knowing that we cannot find life um, of course, in, in the Gospels, uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So the only way that we can have life, and the only way that we can have life in all its fullness, is through Christ himself. So that's why it's saying there, despite knowing that we cannot find life through the law, which we've established, because the only way that we can find fulfillment in life, the only way that we can have the true meaning in life, as it were, in that sense, is through Christ. So, in what ways are we tempted to make our faith about the law rather than about grace? In what ways are we tempted to make faith or uh, to make our faith about the law rather than grace? Yeah. We can slip into that, can't we? So easily, you know. Um, and I think it's going back to what we're saying there as well. I'm kind of better than you, can I say? You know what I mean? Look at your feelings, but I'm all right, Jack. Any idea? You know, and it makes us. I mean, it makes us. Um, it can it makes us feel better about ourselves in one sense, if we can kind of look at somebody else and think, well, you know what, they actually um, broke this law, or broke that commandment, or did this, or did that. Or, did the next thing, I've never done anything like that. Mm. So my faith must be better than their faith. Mm. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, um, again, uh, 
we'll, we'll, we'll probably touch on this in more depth next week, so we will, but um, Jesus says, I think it's, it's either in Romans or Hebrews, I can't remember, but he says that I have not come to abolish the law, but I have come to fulfill the law. So at that point, um, you would need to argue, in fact I was listening to a guy on this this morning, but you need to argue the case that actually um, the greatest commandment about love, etc., can I get rid of the, the laws? Um, although by default it does, if that makes sense. Um, because if we are, I mean, it says, love your God with all your mind, your soul, and your body. Uh, the second one is, is love your neighbor as, your, as yourself, kind of idea. Um, so if we're doing that, then, well, we're not going to hurt them, we're not going to murder them, we're not going to covet what they've got. Um, but the law has still to be there. Um, it still stands, as it were. But we might go into that in a wee bit more depth next week. But thanks for that. That's... The danger is that... In, one of the questions was, I think, um, one of the questions was earlier that we focus too much on the law. So we do. Um, but actually, I think there's a danger that we focus too much on grace as well. So you're not getting the balance there. Um, and as I was saying just a couple of minutes ago, hey, if I'm focusing on grace and God's going to forgive me anyway, it doesn't really matter if I go and rip up the road at 100 miles an hour because God's going to forgive me for it. Um, so there is a danger of focusing too much on grace, and grace is love, as we're saying. Yeah. I, I think as well, when I was thinking about this, um, in what ways are we tempted to make our faith about the law rather than about grace? It's, in one sense, if you've got a set of rules in front of you, it's quite easy. Um, if you've got ten rules in front of you, it's quite easy to follow that, so it is. But if you don't see the parameters, then you're getting into dodgy stuff. Um, so, uh, And also, I mean, these are like moral laws, ethical laws, moral laws, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, blah, 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 and so it goes on. But if we look at the letters um, in the, the, the New Testament, the epistles, the letters in the New Testament, there is a lot of stuff there that was going wrong with the church. And I mean, I'm not going, I wouldn't expect anybody in this uh, place that going to go out and murder somebody, that would just be stupid to think that. You know what I mean? Um, and other laws, you wouldn't expect folk to do that because, well, they're upright, decent, righteous folk. So you wouldn't expect them to break the Ten Commandments, as it were. But when we come into the laws, as it were, that it speaks about or highlights in the letters to the churches, then it can be a different story. Because I think these are harder, if we look at some of them, um, that, was, that was spoken about, whether it's to the church in Corinth, whether it's the church in Ephesus, whether it's the church in Rome, um, or any of these other places. Then we see issues being raised, um, almost in a more personal way, I think, as well, um, because... Um, issues being raised about false doctrine. And A, it's quite easy to start going down the road as somebody who would speak. Um, it's quite easy for a slip down the road of being um, into false doctrine. So as 
seen it with great, some great men and yet they seem to go wrong somewhere down the line. Men who have done wonderful and amazing stuff, really amazing stuff. And yet, at some point, whatever happens, the doctrine changes. And that was one of the massive issues in the church at that time. These guys, they were listening to stuff that was just absolutely crazy. Part of that stuff that they were listening to was the pharisaical laws. Um, don't, don't eat a certain kind of an animal. Don't um, do this, don't do the next thing. And Jesus is saying, no, that's, that's done away with me. That was Old Testament stuff. We've got rid of that. What we need to concentrate on is the New Testament. Um, or um, other stuff like um, uh, other stuff like overindulging um, and whether that is in different addictions. It might be through alcohol. Obviously, there was no drugs at that time, but we can relate that as well. But actually, do we really adhere to that, or do we think much about that? Where it comes, we might have one glass of wine, we might have two glasses of wine, but then we might go into three and four and five and six and seven and four. We know it. We've drank a whole bottle. Does that fall into the same category? Or it might be, um, and I'm really bad for this, or I can be bad for this. Ah, you know what? There's a bar of chocolate through in the kitchen. I'll go and just have a drink of juice and a wee scliff. The bar of chocolate. And you big mistake, you bring a bar of chocolate through and you sit it next to your chair and you think, Oh, you know what? That's really good, I'll just have another wee bit. And then before you know it, half the bar of chocolate's gone. And then by the end of the binge worthy TV you realise you've not got any chocolate left. Over indulgence. Um, what about gossip? One of the biggest topics in the Old Testament, really. Um, you meet Jimmy down the street and you think, oh, by the way, did you hear about that person? Imagine what they got up to. Blah, blah, blah. And so the gossip can start. And Paul, in some of his letters, are writing, is writing warning these new churches about that and I think that's important because what we need to remember uh, way back then was it was a new style of faith there were new churches they hadn't came across it across this type of teaching before and I think they would also uh, kind of veer as it were to what they knew from the Pharisees and that in the temple actually the Pharisees were probably one of the biggest culprits of gossip, so they were. But they actually would have veered towards that because it's what they knew, and this was all new stuff for them. Um, other issues that you might find, as I say, false doctrine, or concentrating on only part of the gifts of the Spirit. Um, and that can be just as bad, no taking everything into consideration. And we've kind of spoke about that today. Just focusing on one part of it and ignoring everything else. Um, and these are dangerous things to do. And we might, I mean, as I say, we would never ever let, if we heard about somebody in our church who had murdered somebody else, oh man, you need to report that. Oh, come on, you can't hear that. That's just ridiculous. And yet we might hear someday about somebody gossiping in the church. And we say, ah, you know, it's okay. It doesn't really matter. And yet it can slay somebody just the same way as a knife can slay somebody. It can cut somebody to the very, very core. It can cut somebody to the very heart. Or other issues as well like a different addictions that it speaks about in there. And another thing is, you see, when we're looking at the pharisaical laws, when we're looking at all these laws that the Pharisees made up, what are we doing? 
I think we touched on this. But what we're doing, we're focusing on man. Because it was man that made up the laws. And then we're being judgmental. So we are. Whereas, again, we've shifted our focus from God's laws to man's laws. And again, that is so, so dangerous. And that is when we're in danger of tripping up. And we have got freedom uh, in grace. We have got freedom in Christ. Um, I always struggle with this, if I'm being honest, because... When you think, oh, you've got freedom for the law, that's great, it means I don't need to keep the laws, I'm fine. That's never its meaning at all, neither it is. Um, we've got freedom of the Spirit. So thanks for that, guys. That was I enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it as much as what I have enjoyed it. Um, next week, as I said, we'll speak on, or we'll look at... Um, how Christ came to fulfill the law. The following week, actually, we won't have a service because it will be Remembrance Sunday, which will be the 14th, if I've got my calculations right. Um, so we'll be at the square again, uh, just around the corner there, for a Remembrance service. Um, and then, um, if I'm right in saying this, I think I am, we can come back here for a cup of coffee um, or a cup of tea after the service there so we won't we won't be meeting as a church per se um, in two weeks time so we'll speak about the fulfilment how Christ fulfilled the law next week and then we'll miss a week and then we'll have our discussion after that if that's okay we're going to sing a song now um, which actually kind